Hey everyone, this lecture is going to be about historical linguistics. So first I want you to take a look at this passage from Middle English. And you can see the Middle English in black and then the, the Modern English gloss in blue. It's from Chaucer. Um, and Middle English was, was uh, around from about 1100 to 1500 AD. I want you to just look at some of the changes that are there. So some of the words sort of look familiar, but there are definitely some, some differences. And we can actually break down uh, the differences to a, a bunch of different levels of linguistic structure. So first of all, you'll notice that some of the words are just unfamiliar. Specifically, if you see this word sweevenings and sweeveness, I don't know how it's pronounced actually, but um, those words don't exist in modern English, um, but they mean dream uh, or dreaming. So this just shows that there can be um, lexical change or a loss of word forms. You can also see um, some instances of semantic change where the, the meaning of a word changes slightly. So for instance, here we have the word fables. Um, which meant sort of a generic story in Middle English, but today it's more of a specific type of story. So we've seen a sort of narrowing of the meaning. We can also see morphological change. So um, Middle English actually had a more complex um, morphological system, including this marker for plural um, on verbs. Uh, you can see the N on the end of all these words, which does not exist anymore in modern English. You say, yeah, it for the plural. You see syntactic change, so word order changes. This reads, but men may some dreams see, whereas in modern English we would say, but men may see some dreams. So historical linguistics is all about looking at language change. And uh, one thing that historical linguists do is they describe language change. So what sorts of changes are common, what are uncommon. Um, but also one of the really interesting parts is about explaining sound change. So not just what happens, but why do these changes happen? There's also a third um, part of historical linguistics, which has to do with reconstructing languages. So um, we don't know exactly how languages used to be spoken or how ancestors of the languages we speak, um, those, uh, so the, like the proto versions of the language families that you heard about in typology, we, we don't know exactly what those were like, but we can make educated guesses by um, inference, by inferring things from, um, from different related languages. And there's actually a video that I'm going to ask you to watch about uh, language reconstruction called the comparative method. We're not gonna talk about that um, today though. So of course, this fo in, this, in this class, we're going to focus on sound change. Um, and you might notice that none of the examples that I showed you in the Middle English example were sound change. And that's not because there was no sound change. In fact, the major difference between Middle English and Modern English was actually a sound change. But the thing is, sound change is harder to see in writing because sounds are not the same as letters. So that's what we're going to spend most of the time talking about today. So why does sound change occur? Well, we can sort of split it into two different types of uh, sources for sound change. One is, you can think of it as something driven by the speaker. So um, one reason something might change is because as speakers, as you know, because we've talked about this a lot, we are lazy, right? Remember co-articulation? Um, how sounds affect neighbor neighboring sounds because our tongue doesn't want to move as much. Um, wants to move as little as possible. Well, the same thing can be the driver of sound change. So um, sometimes speakers will change the way something sounds systematically. Um, sometimes it's to make it easier to produce, or it might be some other reason. It could be uh, like a social motivation, uh, which we'll talk about next week. But in any case, in this case, it's driven by the speaker. Another reason for sound change might be, you, you can think of it in terms of, of what the listener is doing. So as a listener, you might mishear a sound or you might hear it differently than the speaker intended. And in this case, if you've internalized this as the way the sound is supposed to be pronounced, then you're probably going to start pronouncing it the way you heard it, not the way the speaker said it. In this way, sound change can be driven by misperception. And there's also other sources of sound change um, a lot of really interesting social sources of sound change, which we'll talk about more in sociolinguistics.
So just to sort of um, say this in a different way, it's important to always remember that speech is, the whole point of speech is it's the goal to tra to transmit a message to somebody else. And in doing that, there's always going to be a balance between ease of articulation on the speaker's end and communicative effectiveness on the listener's end. In other words, a speaker wants to be lazy and not have to work too hard and do sort of as little as possible to be understood, but they still have to be understood. They have So they have to be careful enough or distinct enough that they can still get their message across to the listener. So we're going to start by talking about articulatory based sound change. The, so this is the speaker driven sound change and this often results from really small and usually unconscious changes by a speaker and often this is to reduce articulatory effort. But it can lead to permanent systematic changes. So what are these small unconscious changes? Well, if you've been paying attention throughout the class, you probably have some guesses already. Remember those articulatory processes that we keep coming back to, like assimilation, um, when sounds start sounding like more like a neg negative, uh, a neighboring sound. Remember, assimilation is the process by which the features of one segment affect the features of a nearby segment. So if your tongue's already in the alveolar position, maybe it wants to stay in the alveolar position if possible. We also have an appendicitis or a deletion, um, metathesis, and then also one that we haven't talked about yet, which is called weakening and strengthening. So we're going to go through each of these individually. So assimilation, again, uh, is when a segment takes on one or more features of a neighboring segment. And there can be assimilation in terms of place of articulation, manner, voicing, or nasality. So let's look at an example. So in Old Spanish, the word for path was semda. <laughs> you probably heard that as, because uh, you can't see my lips because I'm talking online, you probably heard that the same as the modern Spanish, which is senda. But note that there's a difference. In Old Spanish, there was an M, where in modern Spanish, there is an N. So what kind of assimilation is this an example of? So this is, this is an example of place assimilation. And the way that we can figure that out is because we, so when you're trying to figure out what kind of assimilation something is, first of all, highlight the segment that changes, and then look at how it changes. In this case, you have a bilabial nasal going to an alveolar nasal. And um, because of this, this is place of, place of articulation assimilation, because it's changing place. And you can see that why it's assimilation is because it's changing to be more like this neighboring D, which is also alveolar. Let's look at another example. So here's an example from early Old English to later Old English. And don't worry about this vowel length, this colon indicates a long vowel, but you see that the word for slept went from having a D to a T. So what kind of assimilation is this? Well, again, if we look at the segment that changes, we see that the segment that changes is from, goes from a voiced D to a voiceless T. And therefore, this is going to be place, uh, sorry, um, voicing assimilation. And why is it? Well, it's because it's becoming more like this voiceless P. And finally, um, here's an example um, from Latin to Italian. So we go from centum in Latin to cento in modern Italian, or gentem in Latin to gente. So think about what kind of assimilation this is. So what we have is we have a change from a K to a CH, or a G to a J. So you might think this is, so if we, if we think about what's changing, we're changing place, right? Because we go from um, velar to palatoalveolar, or alveopalatal, sorry. The voicing stays the same, but it also changes manner from, um, from a stop to an affricate. So which, which should it be? Should it be manner or should it be place? Well, this is actually a special kind of place assimilation, and it's called palatalization. 
And this is actually a really common form of sound change, and it's when consonants move to a more palatal place of articulation under the influence of a higher mid-front vowel or the palatal glide, y. Yeah. So in this case from um, Latin to Italian, the velar became palatalized, alveopalatal, because of this front vowel, a. The manner of articulation might change as well. Sorry, I keep flipping back and forth, but um, so the important change here is that there's movement of place to the more palatal-ish place of articulation. We don't have a palatal. Um, so, we, so, so it goes to a palatal affricate, but we don't have a palatal stop and we don't even have an alveopalatal stop. So this is actually the closest to a palatal consonant um, that we have without going all the way to a glide. So this is palatalization. It's an example of place assimilation. And if you think about why this might be the case, it's because your tongue's going to be raised um, for, and it's going to be sort of front for a front vowel. And so it, it's a long distance for it to go from the velum all the way up to the front, so it moves forward and becomes palatalized. So again, we go from a velar stop to an alveopalatal Africa in both of these cases, and we keep voicing the same. Nasalization, this one's easy. Um, nasalization, because we've seen so many examples of this, nas nasalization is when a nasal consonant um, affects an adjacent vowel, usually. So in Latin, you had the word unis for um, one, and that changed to un in French. And so what we see is that actually, um, well, this second part dropped off, but also the vowel became nasalized and the N disappeared altogether.